spacing. And I want to do double spacing. Welcome back everyone. I've been busy. Um, I come down every every once in a while to the basement and I do a little bit of tinkering on a particular machine. I gave you guys a hint as to what it is and if you read the title you already know what it is so why am I dragging this out. Uh, the chemicals and stuff that I'm using, uh, simple air duster WD-40, not for what you think. Just don't. Why don't you, before you leave comments, in this video, I'd like you to watch the whole video before you start pumping up the comments box. And yeah, it would be really helpful. Anyway, because I might just answer your question later. Slick 50, supercharged one lube and clock oil. Now, clock oil is a very lightweight, I think it's about 0W20 synthetic oil. Uh, I got so, oh, oh, there's a clue. There's a clue. Uh oh, what's he up to? And a paintbrush, and I got picks, and I got another another pick. And I got another pick over here. We got some rubbing alcohol, some pliers. I got the whole shooting match out here. What the hell am I doing? Okay, so <laughs> there it is. Many of my viewers know what this is. They understand how it works, and uh, and they appreciate what it is and what it meant for. The advancement of technology. For those of you who don't know, the IBM Selectric is not just another boring typewriter that you might find in your great grandma's attic. No, the IBM Selectric is, these were the business workhorses from 1961 until about 1984 when they were discontinued and replaced with a daisy wheel typewriter. I'm probably already over what, okay. Typewriters typically come in three different flavors. You've got the old-fashioned type bar typewriter, where there's these, this row of, I got one upstairs, I should have brought it down, but it has a row of type bars, and you press a key, and they, they swing up and strike the ribbon, and thus leave the paper. Type bar style typewriters have been in production until very recently, uh, when a, there was one remaining company, I think in India, that was still manufacturing them up until just a couple years ago. But they started out in the 1890s, I believe, <laughs> and they have never really changed the design. They're like the internal combustion engine of typewriters. A daisy wheel typewriter, uh, those came about um, when typewriters went full electric and there was some logic and computer controls behind the, 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 the mechanics of the typewriter. The daisy wheel typewriter has a wheel it looks like a daisy, hence the name, and it has characters, one character for each, you know, uppercase, lowercase, it's all right there. They're like arranged in a spoke pattern, like a wagon wheel of all different characters of the rainbow. And what would happen is you, the, when you pressed a key, computer logic controls would um, activate the servo motor, which would spin the daisy wheel to the exact character you selected. And then once it's locked into place, a hammer from behind driven by a solenoid would swing forward and bang. It would strike the back side of the daisy wheel and push only the character you selected into the paper or into the ribbon and then the paper. That's your daisy wheel typewriter. And then there's something different. The IBM Selectric, which uses a golf ball shaped typing element, that's what it's called, that is easily replaceable uh, for all different font choices and other 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 gobbledygook, 
This is what the IDM Selectric uses as its typing element. And these little golf balls are incredible because unlike a tight bar typewriter, they can never jam. You cannot jam a Selectric, more on that later. The other thing is, um, see these again, these were the pre, if, if the daisy wheel uh, typewriters were invented earlier, these probably would have never existed. What makes these unique is that they are, for all intents and purposes, a fully functional digital to analog mechanical computer. Yes. These are a mechanical, they are classified as a mechanical computer in how they function. I know that's a lot to unpack, but that's what they are. A mechanical computer takes input from the user and performs calculations using levers, rods, fulcrums, and in this case, Whipple tree mechanisms to achieve an output. It's wild, man. And in the video that I post in the comments, or not comments, in the, um, in the description of this video, will explain exactly what that means. The gentleman who created the video called it a six bit digital to analog mechanical computer. No, really. It, these are not just typewriters. Oh, they are in their function, but what drives them is what makes them so unique. As I stated, uh, these were, um, in one form or another, these were in production at least since 1961, and IBM used this exact mechanism, or this a very a modified version of it, uh, for their very first computer-driven printers, as far as I understand it. If you watch any movies from the 1960s, 1970s, and you hear a typing noise in the background, chances are the Foley artist took audio clips of a machine like this um, and, and inserted that into the audio of the movie or the TV show. Um, I can I can particularly um, I rec I remember certain episodes of um, of Columbo, which was filmed in the 1970s. In any any office scene, you would hear this rhythmic. There you go. So, what's the deal with this machine? Where did it come from? Why is it here? What did I have to do to fix it? Let's get into it. So this is a this is a correcting Selectric three. This is the very last of the dynasty. The Selectric three uh, yielded to the wheel writer. I believe that's what they called it. And um, it uh, this particular machine was uh, originally delivered by IBM and set up um, where I actually the the place I work in 1981. The exact date, the sticker is still on the bottom. It was delivered and set up in 1981 and it was in use until 2017. Um, it was used for a variety of, um, originally used as the secretary's primary means of typing and generating documents. Um, but more recently it was used to fill out forms. And um, it actually had a service contract on it until about 2015, uh, when that, that was the last year it was ever serviced. This machine was serviced every year of its life, from 1981 to 2015, by a local office supply uh, service company. And I kind of question uh, how good of a service company they are, because I had it apart. And, uh, and you're going to get to see inside as well. And it's not pretty. <laughs> no, this machine is a disaster. Um, my goal, uh, so I, I actually walked into the office uh, to do some um, support work. And they had the thing sitting on this uh, little, it had been there for, I've been there for 15 years and it's just always been there. We actually had a bunch of these. Uh, we had one in every building. I, I work between multiple buildings and every building had one in the main office. And they were all the Selectric 3s. They weren't the, the cool ones. Actually, I think we had a red one. We had a, a Selectric 2 in, uh, in like, a, like a salmon pink. 
I think those are beautiful, actually. I really do. The salmon pink ones are really nice. Um, anyways, we had a bunch of these, and they started getting scrapped um, as they just stopped using them. And this was the last one in use. And I had an opportunity to just make it go away, and I did, because they were just getting scrapped. So um, I dragged it home. I actually have the service documentation in the original owner's manual. Um, when I went back to my office, they, they said they found it, but I'm like, I'm not gonna drive back to get it, so they just inter-officed it to me, and I haven't seen it yet, but um, I do allegedly have all the service inf information and the manual. I might even have the damn sales receipt for it. But, um, so when I brought this home, I actually did get this on video. I might, I might insert it, might not. Uh, but it was dead. It wouldn't do nothing. Uh, you plug it in, and this is, whenever you find one of these in a thrift shop, or wherever you acquire one of these, um, it, 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 hell, Craigslist Marketplace, or face, Facebook, Craigslist, whenever you find these machines, they generally don't work. And it's not terribly easy to get them running in most cases. Depending on how long they've been sitting, depending on how gunked up they are, Remember, it's a mechanical computer. There are more moving parts in this entire machine um, than the Enigma. I mean, this thing is crazy complicated. So a little bit about how it works. It's driven by a small electric motor, and we're gonna take the cover off and I'm gonna show you that. It's driven by a small electric motor which drives a cog belt which then drives a main shaft, which is um, linked by a clutch. There's a, there's a clutching mechanism. When a key is depressed, it engages that main shaft, and it performs a series of voodoo operations and strikes the character to the paper. Like I said, these tight balls, here's, here's this one here. These tight balls, they have, um, actually divided into, in, in, divided in half. You've got on one side, you've got all your uppercase, and you've got your special characters, exclamation, pound, ampersand, dollar sign, at. Down on the bottom here, you've got your, um, looks like your plus sign, some punctuation marks. On the other side, you've got all your lowercase, and I believe your numbers are up on the top. And these are divided up mechanically. The ball has to, once a key is pressed, that main shaft is engaged. The key actuates a series of levers as part of the Whipple tree mechanism, which tells the ball what to do. Tilt this far, rotate this far, strike. Then it returns to its home position until the next key is pressed. Tilt back this way, rotate this way, and say you're, punk, you're, you're typing a capitalized number or letter. It rotates 180 degrees, it tilts, bang. Pretty simple. So I got this machine running, and as you can see, it works. Um, I didn't do it the right way. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to get to, get to the center of a uh, Pop. Um, there are correct chemicals to use and there are incorrect chemicals to use. The last thing you want to do, if you find one of these machines and it's dead, doesn't do anything, motor's frozen, do not use WD-40. This stuff evaporates, all the solvents leave it, and there's nothing behind but gum and varnish. Um, so it might, it will free the mechanism up, you'll get it running, but a week later you're gonna turn it on and it's not gonna work. Um, I'm not saying this is the right stuff to use. I use the WD-40 to remove some sticker residue. That's all it's here for. But what I used is Slick 51 Loop. Now, I've tried this stuff. Um, I have an, an antique clock on my mantle. It's about 90 years old. And it's spring-driven. And um, I actually found out about Slick 51 Lube from a clock forum. I was looking for ways to rejuvenate. The springs are not broken, but what happens with old clock springs is they, um, over time, the lubricants that they're coated with gum up and varnish, just like the pivots in the clock mechanism. And uh, dust gets in there, and they get really gross. So what you've got to do, and then this, the spring sticks. So your seven-day clock might 
last for three to four days, even though it's fully wound. So one suggestion I found was take the clock apart without, see I didn't want to remove the mainsprings because I don't have the equipment to do so. So I dunked the entire clock mechanism into an ultrasonic bath to clean out all the old grease and oil. And what you do is you use your clock oil to lubricate the pivots as you normally would during a normal service, but you spray a little bit of this one lube into the mainsprings between all the windings of the spring. And I said, you know what? I have nothing to lose. I'm going to give it a try. That was eight months ago. The clock is still running. This stuff actually worked. WD-40, on the other hand, would not work. There's no way. WD-40 is its like fool's gold for lubricants. It doesn't lubricate anything. It's good for cleaning. It's good for keeping things, you know, relatively dry. Like, for example, um, it's designed a water displacer 40. That's what it is. It's a water displacer. It's mostly kerosene. Slick 50, on the other hand, I don't know what is in it, but it does contain synthetic additives, whatever the hell that means. And it's extremely long-lasting. My clock proved the point. The stuff actually works. Well, I figured, you know what? I have, once again, I have nothing to lose. If this machine gums up and blows to pieces, I've lost nothing. So, how do we get it apart? remarkably simple. I wish things were still made this way today. This machine was built to be serviced. Honestly. It was built for regular maintenance. In fact, these machines require regular maintenance. That is part of the deal of owning one of these. If you're a business owner and you've got, you know, a couple typists or secretaries in your office, and you're going to buy one of these machines. These cost about $3,000 in 1977, um, which is about as much as a car. To put it into perspective, $3,000 would get you a base model car. These weren't cheap, and they required regular maintenance. So you would set up a maintenance contract with IBM, and that's how IBM made their money. They would sell you a maintenance contract, and you would have them take care of the machine every year or every couple of months tune it up, lubricate it, just like a sewing machine. So, here's what you should do. Open the lid. You're going to unlock or pull your, your paper bale out, your, your ruler guy. That, that opens up like that. You've got these two little thumb levers here. Just go like this. Pull it off. There's your platen. Put that aside on a clean, dry surface. Then we're going to unlock the bottom cover. So we're going to just kind of close these up a little bit. There are two latches. You can actually see right here. It's a little bar. Pull it forward. Same one on the other side. Pull it forward and lift. Just like that. Look at that. So easy. So now we have access to um, not much. We have access to some components. So this is where some of the maintenance comes in, and this is where they gum up. This whole rack right here, uh, I found a couple of videos, I think it was Phoenix Typewriter, type, typewriter Repair or something like that. He did a nice video on how to properly clean and lubricate this whole mechanism. It's involved. It can take hours to do. Um, you have to flush out all the old lubricant, the grease, the oil, with, and he uses lacquer thinner, and I found another person who uses mineral oil. Lacquer thinner will destroy the keycaps if you spill it. Mineral oil will not do that, but I think mineral oil is a lot thicker. And um, a mineral spirits, I'm sorry, mineral spirits, not mineral oil. Um, and lubricant, uh, I believe 0W20 Synthetic Mobile One is what people tend to use on these, from what I've read. So you can see this machine is kind of gross. It's got crap everywhere. It was like that when I got it. Um, only it didn't work. Now it does. <coughs> so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to take... So, alright, like I said, these are designed to be serviced. Oh yeah, I said I was going to demonstrate it. Well, you'll see it later. We'll get there. Okay, so on the back side, you've got the motor, which drives a cogged belt. 
Now, I did mention that the company who serviced this, I'm not really sure how good they were because, well, the motor, uh, the motor, the belt is actually cracking in multiple places. That should have been replaced long ago. Um, in fact, yeah, there's a crack right there. This thing is ready to snap. In fact, I'm surprised it hasn't already. So the belt on this machine is bad. One place where they tend to have problems is actually the pulley on the other side of that, the one that, uh, that's being driven. The pulley is made of nylon, and nylon, as it gets old, it likes to shrink and it likes to crack. How do we get to it? Thought you'd never ask. Unlock it, unlock it here by the ding ding bell. That was gummed up too. The bell did so when I got this thing, it did the motor was frozen. I took the motor out, I freed it up, I used um, what did I use? I used zoom spout oil, which isn't the right thing to use. It should be taken apart and flushed. But I got it wrote I got it going. And I got the machine to spin. You press a key and it would just repeat. And uh, that's because these switches or these levers were sticking. When the motor's off, it doesn't do anything, by the way. You can't even press the keys down. Okay. So we've unlocked the, uh, the entire assembly here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to lift it up. The case is designed in a way that makes it easier to service. It actually has a built-in mechanism for, for holding the mechanism. I'm saying the word mechanism. But it's designed to hold the assembly in place. It has these little rails. Let's take a look at that. It's ingenious. It slides down this rail and you tilt it up like that. Probably should remove that first. <laughs> Whoops. And that gives you access to the underside for both cleaning and servicing. It's a really ingenious design. And you can see this was uh, cast in 1980, anyway, by Rockwell, the Rockwell mold. They use there. Um, I think it was like machine tool and dye or something like that. But underneath, it's an oily, greasy mess. It looks like um, it looks like hell. So the, the the electrical side of this machine is very simple. You've got a simple AC motor, not much bigger than a sewing machine motor, and you've got all these. Now these are live. It's actually plugged in. There's current flowing through this. Well, maybe not right now because it's off. There's two lights. I'll show you what those do in a minute. Um, but you've got some switches and some lights and you got all that crap going on there. Um, that's really there for... Um, the only thing the switch does is it changes the position of the lights when you switch it from uh, 10 characters per inch to it's 12 characters per inch. But again, looking underneath here, you see the heart of the mechanism. Here's that word again. And I've greased and oiled everything on this thing. And you know what? It's actually working really well. Let's see, there's uh, this pulley here, which drives the carriage. And then you've got some cables. There's some, look at these little bicycle cables, little miniature ones. <laughs> Just, this thing is so complicated, I'm not even gonna try to explain the bulk of what it does and how. So let me try to explain the bulk of what it does and how. So a Whipple tree mechanism in its simplest form can be explained like this. So at its most basic level, this is an agricultural application for a Whipple tree mechanism. You've got, um, let's say you're pulling a sled and you've got, uh, let's say, two sled dogs and, um, oh I don't know, four bulls. Clearly the sled dogs aren't going to have much pulling force when compared to the bulls. So you design your whipple tree mechanism or, or harness to use the bulls over here using leverage and fulcrums and all that happy crap to um, reduce the amount of pulling force that they have on your sled. So then you put your two sled dogs, which are the weakest of the pack, and you put them over here. So 
of that, the leverage that the sled dogs um, have is a lot greater than that of the... That's kind of a, one very basic example, but um, the Whipple tree mechanism is also used in mechanical computers when you can you need to change the... Well, just watch the video. I, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Now this particular machine, it was a grimy, greasy, stuck, gunked up mess. So I flushed out the entire thing using the Slick 51 loop uh, into, a, into a rag. I just kind of sprayed under the keyboard and just got all of this nice and wet. And then I worked the mechanism a little bit to get it worked into the pivots. And I sprayed it once again. Um, and then I let it kind of patted things dry a little bit. And then I used some clock oil just little drop, one drop each, into all pivots. Every little thing, every moving piece got a drop of clock oil. What's great about clock oil is it doesn't generally leave a gunky mess afterwards. It is real oil, it is a synthetic oil. In fact, it's probably very close to what you're supposed to use. The one thing I did not do was I did not go through the steps of properly cleaning and flushing with either mineral spirits or lacquer thinner. That's kind of where I failed here, but it worked. Well, let's take a look. IBM, I'm sure, had extensive training programs that anyone servicing these machines for a living would have to go through, much like the courses that I have to go through for my job today. Um, I have to go, every year I have to go, I have to do more training and testing for servicing Apple products, and it's something I've been doing since 2007. Back in the day, you would have to go to IBM's training courses and you'd have to learn how to adjust, set up, and configure these machines. If you get one of these and you have any hope of ever getting it running again, the last thing you want to do, if, if you genuinely want to fix the machine, don't start taking things apart because there are so many ways to screw that up um, almost irreversibly as there are so many adjustments that have to be made, you would want to start out by freeing up the mechanism and start with the motor. Um, like I said, you know, there's just so many ways to screw this thing up and it may not be fixable at that point because the number of people who know how to set these up and are willing to do the job and help you is dwindling. Um, there are some folks left who uh, they have the training materials or they have the, the, the manuals needed and they know how these work correctly and how, they, how they're how they supposed to function. Um, there are so many adjustments and you screw one of those adjustments up and you're never going to get it back. Um, so okay, let's uh, let's move on. To remove the, the ribbon, for starters, simply pull this red lever out and the ribbon cassette just pops right off. Now this machine, once I got the, um, the typing element to move correctly, I still had issues. It would not type for very long. The ribbon wasn't moving, and I didn't realize what the problem was. So the ribbon itself is driven by this spiked um, capstan thing here. And when the ribbon was in place, or when it's in place, that capstan is supposed to swing in and rub up against the take-up spool. And that's how, it, that's how it, it takes up the ribbon as you're typing along. But it was actually stuck right here because there was so much buildup underneath this arm, it would not move. So the ribbon was just bunching up. The other problem it had, um, all these little moving rollers, these were kind of gunked up and stuck um, the bell wasn't working because this bar was gunked up and it wouldn't move. Um, yeah, it was in, it was, it was, you know, this, this typically how you find these though, after they've been sitting for a while. So I want to show you, um, the ball is moved by these cables, these thin cables, and these are very fragile. Um, but one of these rotates the ball. So this one on the bottom is it, it is responsible for rotating the ball like that. Okay. The one above it, that's your tilt. 
I don't want to pull these too much because I don't want to break it. Um, then there's a cable. Which one is that? There's a little cable that, that connects to it. There it is. What does that do? Well, let's see where it goes. I can't move this carriage when the machine is sitting like this. It doesn't want to move. So let's turn it on. There it goes. What's up? Let's move the carriage. Hold the key, hold the space bar down, and it moves the carriage. Now this cable here, I believe that was the strike cable. Uh, let's see where it leads us. I don't really know. Um, so this, oh, you know what? The striking action is is this rod. This this uh, this actually rotates. So if I hit R, that rotates. I don't know why I did that. Haven't done that before. If you hold the return key down, it keeps advancing the paper like that. So a properly functioning machine, you should be able to go all Keith Carlock on this thing and it should never miss a beat, like this. And you can see, it's pretty much good to go. Without jamming up and freezing. In theory, that's how it should work. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put the paper back in and we're gonna do a demonstration of the unit with the covers removed so you can kind of see how things are moving. Um, I'll put the ribbon in, we'll open this up. Pop her on there. In addition to the machine, I also got two brand new ribbons. Unfortunately, the ribbons that I got they had purchased them for the wrong machine, um, so that was uh, that was a bust. Uh, but ribbons are still very much available for these. Um, again, these machines are still in use all over the world. Um, it's kind of funny how even in 2020, the typewriter still exists and is still a thing. Oops, drop it. There we go. Matter of fact, um, when I bought my last car in 2019, uh, they were still using uh, dot matrix printers to fill out forms. I found that befuddling. Um, okay, let's make sure it's tight. We're gonna put the plate and back in. This machine is far from fixed. Um, although it does work reliably, it is not correct. It is not, it still needs work. Um, it needs to be properly flushed, and um, I think when I feel ambitious and I feel like I have nothing else better to do, I will probably go ahead and do that. Is it worth doing? Absolutely. These machines fully serviced can go for over $500 today. Um, it's funny, there are writers and beatniks and just plain weirdos who will pay $500 for one of these machines. And I can appreciate that because it is a fantastically well-made piece of equipment. So let's do this. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at how this machine operates so the cover is removed. I'm gonna put this nice sheet of paper in here. Oh, I'm gonna hit return. Oh, what should I write? Uh, let's see. Well, the great American novel has already been written. Uh, so let's see. Um, let's just type some random words. And I'm going to demonstrate the correct function as well. This is an IBM Flustric 3 from 1981. There are many... Just like 
this one. A power just blinked, by the way. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a good, I'm glad that happened. So, with a normal typewriter, if the power goes out, you can still type by candlelight, but if your typewriter is driven by an electric motor, well, too bad, so sad. But, oops, all right, so I screwed up. I, w I put Bert instead of, but this one is. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and press the correct button, which is gonna backspace the carriage one space. Then I'm gonna type the character that I screwed up, which is a T. Nope, I need to go back one more. There we go. Now I gotta go back, there's an R. I'm gonna type the letter R. So what it's doing is it's, it's over, it's over striking the character that I hit incorrectly with the same character, but with a white film. But this one is mine and it actually works, period. Seriously though, one can easily improve, oh, I've hit a B, I meant, I meant to type a V, I hit a B. So I'm gonna go back one, type B, improve their typing speed and accuracy. The thing is, typing with a typewriter forces the mind to work much more um, differently. I had to double, I see. It's easy, to, it's easy on this machine to hit the space bar too hard and you end up double spacing or quadruple spacing. Make sense? Are we good? Okay. What I want to do now is I'm going to put the covers back on and I'm going to show you how some of the levers, functions, and switches work and what they do. I think I figured out most of it. Um, I don't have the manual. I do have it, but I don't have it. It's one of those weird things. Um, it's just not in my possession. Okay. Um, pretty much, so if you want to know how the mechanism works, again, I'm going to put a video link in the description that you have to watch. This guy explains it fantastically, and his accent really helps too. I think he's British. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, is there anything else? No, that pretty much covers it. Now, this is interesting. If you already own a typewriter, you probably know what tab stops are and how they work. Um, this bar back here, these are your tab stops. The tab stops on a typewriter are what set how far the carriage will move when the tab key is pressed. See how it stops? That's why they call them tab stops. And on a regular typewriter, even my 1930s, look at the 30 or 31 um, Underwood, number five, the tab stops work exactly the same way, only it's more linkagey and complicated. So let's go ahead and hit return. And I'm gonna show you what the tab stops actually do. So when I when I hit the tab key to the first tab stop, see these little fingers? These little bumps? Now these are little movable um, switches, if you will, and if I hit the tab set or clear button, it moves those. So let's see if we can get a good view of that on camera. Yeah, see what it does is it rotates the whole bar and you see that little finger right there? There's a little finger. See it? That little guy right, that little tab, that little piton. So what it's doing is it's rolling the bar which pushes these little movable lever thingies back and forth to change their position, like a dip switch. So that's tab clear, that's tab set. And I can see on this angle, I'm get a camera in there, you can see that move. That's cleared and that's set. No, that's the other way around. This is clear and that is set. So I'm gonna clear that tab. Clear. 
We're gonna hit the tab key one more time. I'm gonna show you the next set. See where that little finger right there, this, this, this guy here, see how that's pushed in? That's my next tab position. So here we go. It's gonna stop right there. I'm gonna clear it. I'm gonna hit the tab key again. Wrong one. Where is it? There it is. Yeah. I'm gonna clear that one. Hit the tab key again. Clear. Clear. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna put these all into a row. Pretty cool, huh? Clear, 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 clear. Just clear them all. That's exactly how the tab stops work on many antique typewriters. Well, you know, the 1930s and 40s and such models. Now that I've cleared all the tabs, it just goes back and forth, like that. If I want to set a new tab position, one, two, three, four, five, that's what we typically use these days, I want to press tab set. And it's going to move one of those fingers back to where it was. Oh, I spelled it. Yeah. This key, you press it once, like, like that far, but you press it further, very easy. If you're not used to this keyboard, it's going to drive you nuts. <laughs> it's going to say that. It's just going to drive you insane. Okay. I've owned two of these before. One of them I found in the dump. The other one, I don't remember. I think I got it from work. It was one of the other machines we had. And they were both gummed up beyond belief. I didn't really understand how they worked, and I just started messing around, and I ended up breaking the damn things. Um, it's very easy to get discouraged and frustrated. So if you if you find one of these, you buy one, and you you want to um, you want to mess with it, clear your head, clear your workbench, and just work a little bit at a time. And you're going to want to find the I think it's Phoenix Typewriter. He has a great video on how to rejuvenate these things and get them working correctly. Um, you're going to need to get some chemicals. You're going to need to uh, mostly, I think, I think he uses um, lacquer thinner, of course, and uh, Zero W20 oil. But clock oil is designed for low power mechanisms that just tick away all day long without gumming up. Um, clocks are very sensitive to to uh, impurities in the oil. Um, fun fact, clock oil used to be made from whale blubber, but that's no longer a thing for some reason. All right, so take the plate and back out. I want to set these switches to a middle position. I think right about there. Otherwise they get stuck. Okay. So when I get the cover back on, we're going to take a look at how some of the, or what some of these functions actually do. Did I lock this back in? Let's see. Yeah, I did. I want to take a moment to talk about some, oh yeah, before we go any further, um, you're going to notice there's a lot of foam on these typewriters. There's foam under the keyboards, there's foam underneath the, um, the mechanism, there's foam in the... The foam is there as a sound deadener. And the problem with that foam is it degrades very, very badly. And it often degrades in such a way... Oops, I forgot to pull this forward. What happens is it begins to degrade in such a way that it gets caught in the mech in the moving parts. It degrades and it gets caught in the moving parts and it gums things up. 
I've already gone ahead and removed all the foam from the keyboard and I used, that's what I use these picks for. What I had to do is I had to remove a couple of keys, not all of them, but very gently. What I had to do is I had to um, use these picks and gently pull it out. Um, the foam looks like this and uh, you want to remove this before it gets really bad because again it can dissolve into a basically a gunk and once it's in its gunky state it requires some major disassembly. Um, the foam underneath the machine I've already removed. Uh, it came out as one piece fortunately but we have foam up here that um, when you push it in with your finger it stays that way so it's definitely in need of re removal. The only thing that foam was there for, again, is for sound deadening. And once they get to be 40 years old, it's just an accident waiting to happen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna lock this back down, push these levers forward. Like so. There we are. And here's our platen. We're gonna drop it back in. But they loaded these suckers up with foam like you wouldn't believe um, because they were used in office buildings. Um, they had to be relatively quiet. So there you go. I'm going to put some paper back in. One thing that uh, I've noticed about these machines is they're only single color ribbons. Um, my grandmother had a typewriter back in the day it was just a mechanical typewriter just an old-fashioned one and it was a it was you know red and red and black so two colors um, and it surprised me that IBM I don't think they ever made a version of this that uh, yeah. so let's um, put the bail there. So let's lock it in okay. papers relatively straight all right what do these levers do let's take a look Okay, this one's pretty self-explanatory. That's your your paper bail, um, bailing arm. And you wanna slide these rollers so that they line up correctly like that. This is your character's perish. Remember those switches I was telling you about? Those little rotary, those little contact switches in the wiring? What that does is it changes which light is illuminated. Well, let's open the hood real quick. Top row, bottom row. And that corresponds to this little dashboard thing. Let's take this light, turn that off, turn this light off so you can see it better. Shut off, there you go. So that just changes your character spacing from 10 to 12 characters per inch. If you've ever used an old um, DOS-based word processor, characters per inch was a standard that was, um, when you changed your font, like WordPerfect, you would have to change your um, your font, well, not your font, but it would change the, the line spacing from uh, anyway. leftover from typewriter days. Okay, we're gonna set our margins to the normal margin size, which would be um, for eight and a half by 11, you would do 10 and 80 at uh, 12 characters per inch. I'm gonna show you the difference between the two. We'll do some demonstrations. Okay, now this right here is your um, your paper nip roller disengagement uh, lever. This one over here uh, disengages the um, the detent on the platen. Margin release. Uh, margin release is included on a lot of the old-fashioned mechanical typewriters. Pretty self-explanatory. Let's go ahead and demonstrate that. I notice my battery in my camera no longer holds a charge. I'm gonna have to get a new one. It's about ready to drop dead. Here we go. Oops, what did I do? Hit the return key. Let's go back. I'm typing away, typing away, typing away. Writing my manifesto. Oh crap, I've reached the end of the margin setting. So all I gotta do is hit margin release and keep typing away. Okay. 
next thing I want to show you is characters per inch. We're going to start off at 10 characters per inch. If you just did. And then I'm going to do a quick 12 character per inch type. So here we go. Now we're at 12. Da 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 I'm going to do is I'm going to set it one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, set, one, two, three, four, five, set. I think I double spaced that one. Okay, so now, see? Cool stuff. Now, index, um, it is a preset. Space, I believe. Oh, I screwed something up. Oh my god. Oh my god. See, you commenters are gonna get me on this. I was, I wasn't thinking. This is your line space adjustment. Single space, double space, triple space. So here we go. But. I want it to be oh, one and a half double. So it's one and a half, and that's double. So one and a half. Line spacing. And I want to do double spacing. Look at that. Pretty cool, huh? So I'm going to do a close up of the correcting ribbon. So here we go. I'm going to type some uh, caps lock. By the way, caps lock locks the shift keys down. You release it, you're getting a shift key. See it? Okay. I'm going to type something. I'm going to type my name. There's my name, Brandon. But wait, I want to erase it. So I hit correct. Goes back one space. I type a capital N. Go back one more space. Capital O. Now what if I type a capital M? So it types an M, which doesn't completely erase the D I just typed. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to type a capital D, right? There we go. Go back one more space, capital N, A, we get what I'm dropping. My name is now erased, but I'm going to retype it in lowercase. Pretty cool. Cool. I think I'm gonna title this video the worst IBM Selectric video on YouTube because that's what it is. I showed you how to improperly get your Selectric running, but you know, there is something to be said for the, the method that I used. It, what it will do is if you have a machine that you just, you just wanna have some fun. You wanna see it work because you think it's cool. I think it's cool. I won't judge you. You don't judge me. So, you want to get that machine running, you can use the chemicals of mass destruction to get it done. Just realize that there's a possibility that a month from now, I'm going to come down to this basement, I'm going to turn it on, and the motor will be locked up. Because I didn't flush out the old oils or the old grease. By the way, the grease I used, um, I had to put some grease in a few spots. This is what I used. I used AGS Sil Glide. It is a silicone grease. It works really well. Um, everything I've used it for has been like, wow, that's awesome. <sighs> Man. Well, hey, not for nothing, but it works. Now, this is where you gotta get careful. This is where you gotta be careful. There's a lot of people on eBay, Facebook Marketplace, Etsy, I'm looking at you, Etsy. A lot of hipsters and wackadoodles and just plain people with ill intentions and a lack of knowledge. 
like to peddle their wares, and they think that anything vintage is the bee's knees. Look, I was a hipster before it was cool, because I've always loved old stuff. I've, ever since I was a little kid, I was born in 84, a lot of modern machines that predated me that I thought were really freaking cool. But when I was into this old stuff, it wasn't cool. It was like, you're a lame -o. I guess I was born a lame -o. What I'm getting at is there's a lot of people who don't fully appreciate the complexities of these machines who are going to take a machine like this, they get it at Goodwill, right? They pay $20 for it, they drag it home, they douche the shit out of it with WD-40. Oh my god, it's fixed! Hey, look, I fixed it! It's fixed! Look, it's awesome! And then they go on eBay and they look up what they sell for, or they go online and they search for how much is an IBM Selectric worth, and they come up with a figure of $600 and they open up an Etsy store and they're selling their um, hand-painted crafts and they, their antiques that they bought from the antique store and they painted gold or blue because it's cool and hip. And then they go and they, they buy, they take one of these IBM Selectrics that they just um, drowned in WD-40 and they put a price tag of $700. Then somebody else, another hipster, who wears Birkenstocks and drives a Toyota Echo with stars painted all over it, sees that typewriter, then they dip into their trust fund account and they spend $700 plus $95 shipping and handling to get this super cool typewriter which they display in their um, Manhattan studio apartment that their parents are paying $5,000 a month for. And they're like, hey, look, I'm cool. I have a typewriter. Wow! Vintage! Don't do that. That was stupid. I just marked up the plate. Now i got to clean it. Damn you, hipsters. And then, after they get it delivered to their house, it dies. Two weeks later, six months later, motor won't spin. Then, then they realize that they're screwed. So then they go on YouTube and they type in, why, I'm doing it again, why won't my Selectric turn on? Why won't my Selectric turn on? Or why da 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 da? This person ripped me off. And then they see a video of a guy drowning their Selectric in WD-40. And you know something? I bet you that'll work. I bet you that will get that Selectric running again. Because what's going to happen is all that WD-40 that gummed up will get re-liquefied by more WD-40. And there you are. You've got a it's electric that's addicted to WD-40. Um, I don't mean... <laughs> so, and that's the circle of life, my friends. But there are plenty of folks who service these correctly with new belts and parts that have broken. If you turn one of these things on and it goes clunk, 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 it's that nylon pulley inside, which is an act of Congress to replace, but it's doable. You can still buy the part. Um, if the motor spins and nothing happens, there's a possibility that the belt is broken. This one is actually about five minutes away from having a broken belt. Where was I going with this? Yes, so they're going to charge a good amount of money for those. They're going to charge $500, $600 for a machine that's been properly serviced. But the thing is, you've got to separate the wheat from the shaft. You've got to find the ones that are being serviced legitimately by legitimate people who actually appreciate these machines than by somebody in their parents' basement looking to make a few bucks from unsus unsuspecting consumers with more money to burn than I'll ever make in a lifetime at the age of 22. 
No, I'm not bitter. <laughs> now, that all having been said, after I've thoroughly trashed the Etsy crowd, I'm sorry if you're one of them. I've gone on Etsy and I found, see, I'm a preserver. I like to preserve things. I like to find antiques that are preservable and bring them back to where they once were. Um, but I find that Etsy is full of, I don't even know what to call it. Um, you know, they'll buy like some random, what turns out to be a very rare object and um, they don't know any better. So they paint it blue and put stickers all over it and then they charge a fortune for it on Etsy. Um, I know Etsy's not really that bad and I'm being unfairly biased and judgmental and I, I apologize for that, I really do, really do. Look, if you wanna buy um, Bakelite rotary phones from the 1930s and color them with crayons and put ironic stickers on them um, and then sell them for $500, that's, hey, Capitalism is a cool thing, you know, you can make money doing things that, uh, that are otherwise desecrational, but that's your business. Um, doesn't mean I have to like it. You know. um, I'm reminded of the folks who buy up antique typewriters, like old Underwoods and Coronas and you know some of the really nice ones too. And they don't work and they don't want to try to fix them, so they just rip the keys off and make necklaces out of them. And if you're one of those people, you suck. I'm sorry, you suck. If you're ripping apart antique typewriters to pull the keys off to make freaking necklaces and you're a douche novel. Um, okay, I'm getting really mean, and I don't mean to, I apologize. I'm an asshole, by the way. Um, Anyways, what am I going to do with this IBM? Well, hell if I know. I, I, you know after, <laughs> this, is where, this is where I get hypocritical. I really don't like this color. Um, I really, really, really don't like this color. This is like the worst of the worst office beiges I've ever seen. It's, I think taupe is the correct term for this. Um, this is when IBM was starting to lose creativity. They actually made these in a variety of colors, including black, um, salmon pink, blue. I had a blue one. I know I had a blue one. It's electric too. And those are really cool colors. I mean, really nice. This one, I just feel sorry for it. Um, this is the worst color. I was thinking about painting it a different color. I'm thinking something really radical, like bright yellow or, or red, or even powder blue. What are your thoughts on that? I really want to know. What are your thoughts on that? Not to sell it on Etsy for $800. No, no, my friends. I, I'm not one of those people. But I think that this would look really nice in any other color than what it is because this color is just bloody awful. It could be cleaned up. It's, so it's got a cover. I have the original cover for it. This is what it looks like. It's definitely in rough shape. What's happened here is the cover has begun to degrade and trans, uh, trans and superimpose them, if I, the vinyl to the painted surface, making it look like shit. Um, so that happened. How do we clean that? I've tried WD-40, it didn't really touch it. I'm gonna try rubbing alcohol, let's see if that does it. Oh yeah, oh look at that. that rubbing alcohol, sometimes it's a, a miracle here, I'm telling you right now. Rubbing alcohol cleans it right off. So we can make it look beautiful again. Woo, beauty. Um, but we don't like the color. I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do with this machine when I'm bored with it again. Um, and I don't know whether I'm gonna keep it, whether I'm gonna try to make some money on it. But what I won't do is I will not advertise this machine as a restored, fully fixed, ready to rock and roll, Stephen King approved, write the next great novel on this machine. No, no, because I know that I didn't do it right. But it works. You can't
can't deny me that. It does work. Long. Now I'm just kind of going on and on. Andrew. Well, that's why you came here to watch this video. If you want to see me lose my shit. Well, there we are. Look at that. It actually came, came right back. Look at that. It's, it's, all right, maybe we won't repaint it, but maybe we will. Stay tuned and find out. All right, I get it. It's not that I hate trust fund kids or I'm bitter about them and their little Etsy stores and their, you know, their $8,000 a month LA apartments. It's just that when I was 18, all my parents gave me was a carton of Marlboro Lights and a copy of the newspaper with all the apartments circled in the ad section. Just saying. I mean, you know, and I think I got a gallon of gas uh, on a gift card. But that's it, you know. That's, that's just how I grew up. Um, you know, I didn't get a free apartment in L.A. or... Um, <laughs> And, hey, look, if they want to start these little Etsy stores and feel good about themselves and and uh, desecrate antiques, that's fine. You know, that's okay. It's a free country for now. But, um, you know, I just, just, you know, it's actually really cleaning up nicely. Look at that. Look at that. It's a miracle. Miracle on 34th Street. I'm gonna sell you one Etsy for a million dollars. And a hipster's gonna pay it without asking any questions. And they're gonna bitch about the packing job because I'm gonna pack it and I'm gonna wooden Yeah. yeah. Look at that. Hipster lives matter. If we all have hands and friends. That really works. Yeah, rubbing alcohol, that's the that's the ticket. That's the ticket. That's not why they call it rubbing alcohol, by the way. Well, I kind of wonder sometimes. Look at that. Beautiful! Like brand new. What do you think? Hot pink? Yeah, yellow? Cardinal yellow? Cardinal 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 red. Uh, daisy yellow. What do you think? What do I got for pink? What do we got? Let's see. I got green. I got metallic silver. I got silicone lubricant. Clear lacquer, black, ooh, black engine enamel. That would look nice. Uh, let's see. Ooh, this would look cool. This is alloy wheel paint. That would look nice. I got, ooh, yeah, even better. I still have some of this fluorescent high visibility pink. That would look kind of cool in there. And I have a farm implement yellow. So there's that. So possibilities are endless, man.